I don't think we should be focusing on Loki. That guy's brain is a bag full of cats. You could smell crazy on him. I've care how you speak. Loki is beyond reason, but he is of Asgard. And he is my brother. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. Welcome back to Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. This is Wes. We've got the first episode of the new Loki series on Disney Plus dropped today. You're here with me to talk about that is my good friend, comic book writer, Aaron Sparrow, the man that brings home five figures a week. How you doing, Aaron? I'm doing fantastic, Wes. How are you doing? I'm doing new, excellent. New dad and all. Absolutely. Yep. We got things are getting back to normal. We're in the house and uh, time to get back on the, the YouTube grind, watching a bunch of nerd stuff, read a bunch of comics. So this is exciting stuff. This is the MCU Disney Plus property I was the most excited about. I figured this was going to be the most fun thing that they were attempting to do, at least initially here in the Disney plus MCU like um, universe that they're doing. And I'm going to say, Aaron, not a lot of fun to be had in here. There's some jokes here and there, but I don't, doesn't feel like they, they really capitalize on the appreciation people have for Loki as a character. No, it was a lot of setup. It was uh, a lot of groundwork being laid and kind of catching the character of Loki up to where he was, uh, at, you know, he, he basically, without giving away too much, uh, they kind of catch him up to the events of well, his life. That's a spoiler that. filled, Aaron. You don't have to, you can give everything away. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay, cool. We're All assuming right. everyone has seen it. Yeah, if you haven't if you haven't seen it, you, you stop stop now, go watch it, and then, <laughs> and then come back. Uh, and then leave a like and, and click the subscription button and all that all that YouTube stuff. Uh, but uh, so basically, you know, they they kind of wrote themselves into a corner a little bit with Loki, where they killed off the Loki that had all the character development from Thor Ragnarok and kind of had come into his own and, and reestablished his uh, brotherly relationship with Thor and and uh, gained an appreciation for you know their father Odin. And so they kind of had to catch him up in this episode. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of groundwork being laid, a lot of things being set up, uh, but they've only got six episodes. So hopefully this first episode is all of the setup that they need and we can be off to the races with the next because you're only going to have about four episodes of fun zipping around the multiverse. Hopefully that's what the show is because that seems to be what everybody wants, uh, you know, before you have to have the last episode be the big finale. So I, I don't know how they're going to pull it off. I'm not sure either. I thought this was just going to be Loki jumping around the multiverse, getting into two adventures, a little bit of mischief here or there. That is certainly not the narrative that we're getting so far. We have a couple of big, uh, well, at least one big character introduced, Mobius in Mobius. I guess he was, he's part of the, what is it, the Time Variant Authority. He's been associated with She-Hulk and Kang. We know that they're coming into the MCU within the near future. They're, they're coming in the next couple of years. I don't personally, like Owen Wilson's, he's funny from time to time. There's almost no charm or, or charisma to this version of whatever he is he's playing. He's just kind of a straight character here. Feels like a waste of, of Owen Wilson. And I don't know, am I supposed to be excited about the introduction of, of Major Mobius? That I, that I can't tell you because I didn't even remember this character from the comics. Uh, we had to go back and do it, do like a deep dive, and you had to tell me where he first appeared. <laughs> I was like, "Whose run was that?" I don't even remember. So it, it's not like he was a major character to be brought in that like blew my mind. Uh, I think that you're you're right. He is very dry and stale in this, but for me, it kind of worked because I think that that is going to play well off of Tom Hiddleston's overt charisma. Uh, and so far, I'm starting to feel like this this show is going to be Tom Hiddleston just carrying everything on his shoulders because there's not a lot there's not a lot in this first episode established that that makes me super excited from the show except for what kind of had me excited from the beginning which was oh tom hiddleston is so into this role and he he so enjoys what he does that it's kind of infectious so uh yeah he's yeah. one of the last vestiges of when the mcu could not they, they just had perfect casting Yes. Like almost everyone that they were casting was just like dynamite that's the perfect person of this probably no better casting than than uh, Tom Hiddleston as Loki and, and probably uh, Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Yeah, I think those two are definitely the uh, the high points. And uh, the, just, like I said, just just mad charisma from Tom Hiddleston. He enjoys what he's doing, and that uh, you know that translates to us enjoying watching him. My question is: Is this plot going to get going? Is it going to be a romp around the multiverse, or is it going to be kind of like a dour 
pursuit of himself, because that's essentially what they established in this episode, that the villain is a version of him. So we, that might lead to some really fun things. We might get, uh, you know, some really scene chewing performances from him as a, as a fully realized evil version of Loki, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the more misunderstood, you know, God of mischief that, uh, that they're portraying him as in the uh, MCU. So, you know, it could lead to very interesting things, but with the, you know, the, uh, the Winter, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I don't felt that that stuck the landing at all. And so, you know, although I enjoyed WandaVision, uh, you know, right now they're one and one for me. So this is uh, this is like, this is the tiebreaker here. So I've got a problem with the setting, at least for the first episode. We get the, the time variant authority and essentially it's just, you know, a kind of stale, mundane 1970s work environment. A trope we've seen in movies and, and shows before, but it was so it's done so much better in Beetlejuice, where they really like use that environment to, to play off some good jokes and, and create something there. And it just it doesn't feel like they used it for anything other than just some background here. Like why even do it? It was basically all aesthetic. I think that it was done yeah. better and more recently, you know, much to the same you know, the exact same kind of idea, uh, just executed in much better fashion uh, in the Umbrella Academy, which was uh, which was a lot of fun. You know, they, they really leaned into it and leaned into the aesthetic. And here it's, you know, I get it. They're, they're trying to establish this this idea that the universe is a uh, is a stale bureaucracy. Um, and that that's been done before. And like you said, to much better effect. So, you know, it was it was fine, but it, it didn't really didn't really blow my mind because we've seen it before and we've seen it done better. Yeah, so that that part let me down, and then we get we get this basically it's interrogation from uh, Mobius and Tom Hiddleston's Loki, and he's doing exactly what we kind of talked about earlier. He's catching him up. He's talking about the things that he's done in the past, and you know, do you like hurting people? Do you like killing people? He's oh, I'm the god of mischief, and he's like, listen, you know, you you jab somebody's eye out. You're, you're laughing and you're kind of smiling when you did that. You've murdered all these people and kind of reminding him of the sins of the past that maybe he isn't the nice guy that Loki sees himself as. And I thought it was, it was pretty effective. It was, you know, it kind of went on for a while, but probably the most effective part of the episode is when he finally, they're, they're talking about the Avengers and he's like, you're the foil, your purpose in this multiverse is to unite people against you and and for them to rise up and become greater than themselves. Like you're, you're the motivation, but you're never going to be a King. You are never meant to be a King. And, you know, Loki kind of has always seen himself as the true, uh, you know, heir to the throne in greater than Thor. And, uh, you know, I thought that was done a good effect. Yeah. I thought that was done very well. I thought the things with uh, his mother and especially pointing out the fact, you know, something that he never realized in the, uh, in the films, uh, you know, because the, the, the Thor films were kind of disjointed and, and seemed to be hastily assembled for the most part. Uh, he never realized that he's directly responsible for the death of his mother because he's the one who pointed out where they should go, hoping that they would murder Thor and instead they encounter his mother and murder her. And so I thought that was, that was done to, to great effect is, uh, you know, touching back on his relationship with, uh, with her. Now, was that the first time that he knew about that or is, has this version of Loki experienced that? I can't remember where this takes place in the timeline. No, he, this is because this is before any of that happened. So he yes. gets to see, you know, so he, um, he had no idea that his mother was even dead, you know, this version yes. of Loki. And he certainly didn't know that he was responsible for it. And I don't even think that the version uh, that was killed in Endgame, uh, I don't think that he was really aware that he was directly responsible. He knew that she had died. Um, and but he hadn't put it together. Yeah, he hadn't put it together. That it was it was his direct actions that led them to her. Yep. So that, that was a good reveal. I, I give him marks on that. Then there's like a weird event that happens where Mobius, he gets interrupted. He has to leave. Loki escapes because he is Loki. And then when he escapes, he decides to come back and watch the rest of the footage because he wants to see, I guess, you know, ultimately what his fate is. He sees his father uh, pass away and he kind of sees that in the end he's redeemed and dies at the end of hands of Thanos as a, a pseudo hero, perhaps. 
Yeah, I think that, too, they, they established pretty well that uh, the item, you know, he's got the Tesseract again, and he's trying to jump out of the Time Variance Authority, and he can't seem to do it. He can only jump around their offices. And I think that's when he realizes that this is real. They actually do have a considerable amount of power, where at the beginning he's, he's you know, he obviously thinks that this is all a joke and that, you know, they're fools and, you know, that he can easily, you know, once he gets his hand on the te- uh, back on the Tesseract, he can, you know, make them all pay and, and escape. And he realizes that he can't, so he really has no other choice then to go back and then you know since he's there alone in the room you might as well see how everything plays out since he's got the little device that shows his whole history and when he sees that it kind of uh, kind of shakes him to his core so i thought that was all very well done but like i said it's uh, it's a lot it took of a long time to do it yeah a very long time to do it uh and you know even things that we were kind of shown in the trailers like uh, like the db cooper sequence you know it was like oh loki's gonna be db cooper this is gonna be fun adventures him jumping around no it's just a thing that he did you know he it was a highlight i enjoyed it you know i yeah, figured it, it out before they nice. announced it's like oh he's db cooper it's yeah, cool i was like I, I but i got that from the trailer so like this was not a new revelation to me uh and it was neat to see him do it and with all the charm that tom hiddleston brings uh and it kind of made me go i would watch a db cooper movie with Tom Hiddleston in the lead. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, ultimately, it's something fun that was promised in the trailer that kind of hinted at this this idea that he was going to be jumping around and doing all of these exciting things in all these different places. And it's it doesn't seem like that's going to be the show that we're going to get. And maybe that was too much for us to expect on a, uh, on a TV show budget, but that definitely looked like what the trailer was promising. So that's, that's kind of on them. I would have much preferred him jumping around shenanigans, altering history and being a focal point of all these things that have happened, uh, you know, just as because he's mischievous. And in this case, he had a he lost a bet with his brother. You know, so he ends up doing the D.B. Cooper thing. Uh, and that that part, would f- that was fun, but it, it's only like two minutes. Yeah. And, you know, part of the reason of going back to this more mischievous version of Loki before he had all the all the character development and, and had kind of matured in the films, I thought part of the reason for that was because he was going to be bouncing around causing havoc and, and just being, you know, the god of mischief. And, and it, you know, again, we're not we're kind of not getting what they sort of promised us in, in the trailer and, and by doing that. So I don't know how people are going to feel about this. I mean, obviously, you're going to have your... Uh, your hardcore Loki fangirls and, and things like that that draw all the fan art that are just, just, just going to love it because it's Tom Hiddleston. But I, I don't know. I feel like the since Endgame, I don't know that the MCU really has a path forward that's interesting or compelling. And this this show is kind of the make or break, I think, because you know people there's a lot of people that didn't enjoy WandaVision. Uh, either they thought it was too weird or they just didn't like the payoff. And uh, there's a lot of people that didn't like Falcon and Winter Soldier. I mean, I was kind of indifferent to Falcon and Winter Soldier in a lot of ways. So this one's really kind of the make or break for these shows on Disney+. Plus. I mean, I'm sure the machine will keep going no matter what. But, you know, we're getting into a movie period uh, with Phase 4 where it's Shang-Chi and Eternals that there's virtually no buzz on. And, you know, the only thing that anybody seems to be really looking forward to in Phase 4 is Doctor Strange 2. So this is largely, I'm sure, going to set that up. But yes. If this is just setup, you know, six episodes of setup for a movie, I don't know how people are going to feel about it. And so far, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. I, I enjoyed things about this first episode. I liked the interplay between Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston, and I thought that they have good chemistry. Uh, like you said, Owen Wilson is a little stale and dry, but I think that's intentional, and hopefully yeah. that uh, that plays into like a lot of good comedic moments moving forward. But yeah, just kind of a, it's. I don't know if like I'd give like, it like yeah I'd like give it a six out of ten like and that six is all Tom Hiddleston yeah. charisma yeah it's like a two and a half three three out of five stars for me but there were a couple of reveals you you mentioned it earlier we we do find out that the big bad is Loki himself obviously deviated from another timeline that is uh, I don't know I guess he's a fire starter he's burning people kind of the last episode the other big reveal I don't know if it was a big reveal. But certainly hinted at at the opening scene when we meet Mobius is when he's in a chapel. They're investigating something that's happened. And a little girl that he's talking to who's gotten uh, some type of gift from, from somebody from another time zone or time frame. And she kind of points up and it, it appears that this is the first mention of or this is the introduction of Mephisto in the MCU. It seemed like it, but I think that that was another just red hair. Do you think that was the episode? Do you think that was Tom Hiddleston himself? 
the other yeah, version? Yeah, because she's going to point to the devil because maybe she saw Loki with the with the crown, you know, with his horns. And so in her mind, she interprets that as the devil. That That's kind of like where I went by the end of the episode, you know, because I thought, oh, maybe they are finally going to introduce Mephisto. And this is going to be really interesting. And then when we got a little further on, I was like, no, I bet you, I bet you they're going to follow the comic and he's going to have to fight himself. And then, of course, they reveal that at the end of the episode. The villain is you. And then I was like, oh, OK, so I, there is no Mephisto. There is no devil. It's it's Loki. He was probably wearing the crown. And that's why she thought, oh, it's the devil because of the horns. So you just mentioned something I do think we need to be weary of. They're basing this on a story arc, loosely based. It's not going to be directly, you know, it's not going to go frame by frame or anything. But this is a story that wasn't like a huge hit or anything, but is also written by somebody that is a bad comic book writer named Daniel Kibblesmith. If you remember the, what is it, the New Warriors that they haven't released yet, but one of the most downvoted trailers of all time in YouTube history He's the writer of the source material for this. And that worries me, if I'm being honest, Aaron. Yeah, Loki, Agent of Asgard, uh, not a not a great series uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Not one that was very memorable. I saw that they're resoliciting it. Uh, they're doing a resolicitation of it to tie into this, of course. Uh, but I don't expect uh, many people to, to order it. Um, yeah, you're right. Daniel Kibblesmith, just not a good comic book writer. Uh, he doesn't have good ideas. He doesn't understand heroism. Uh, if you've seen him, I mean, that video where he was pushing New Warriors, when the very first thing that you say is that you were too intimidated to read the original book because you saw a black man with a blade coming out of his gauntlet on the cover, and that made you, you know, that, that intimidated you. A drawing intimidated you. You were not a bastion of, uh, of masculinity and... Uh, and, you know, telling stories of heroic fiction. Sometimes you have to read things that make you uncomfortable. Fiction is allowed to make you uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> and, and absolutely it should in a lot of ways. So, you know, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think that the source material is anything to, uh, to crow about, but, you know, this is probably, this probably wasn't Daniel Kibblesmith's idea initially, you know, the way Marvel tends to work now is an editor says, Hey, we want to do a series where the character does this and then hands it off to somebody. So the germ of the idea is not bad. Uh, and the MCU, you know, they have a habit of taking comic book stories and changing them up, you know, just taking the germ of the idea and doing their own thing with it. So I don't think, you know, I don't think that we're probably in too much danger of, of getting a uh, boring Daniel Kibblesmith type story. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it, how it plays out. You know, like I said, I think that what's going to carry this is, uh, is Tom Hiddleston's charisma. And hopefully we get... Uh, a good story to go along with it because it it would be nice to be excited about the MCU again. Well, what the, what Marvel has to be worried about, not everyone's going to know who Daniel Kibblesmith is and kind of what he represents to modern comic book readers is, is, but there are enough people out there that once they see his name is attached to the story that they're basing this on, they're going to be looking for a lot of Daniel Kibblesmith esque ideas of, uh, you know, you already said he's uncomfortable by, by reading certain things. You couldn't read a comic book because there was some imagery he didn't like. And people might be seeing things that aren't even there just because it's attached to something he made. I've already kind of seen that with reviews of the first issue on, well, not really reviews, but commentary on Twitter. I've seen some people who are like, oh, this, this show was so SJW. And I'm like, I don't even, how? How? Like, I don't I didn't get that person. personally. Because was is it because there were two female characters in in it? One was a judge and one was a guard, and the guard was kind of pushing Loki around. Was that was that SJW? I don't I don't I don't even know what that term means anymore. And you know the thing that he played the guard for a fool. You know he ended up getting his neck thing around her and was putting her in you know fast forward and reverse over and over and over just for the fun of it. Yeah, he uh, you know he runs into two people who have power over him initially. And then uh, he reverses it. Uh, you know, one person just kind of like fades out immediately because they're only in it for that specific purpose of, of passing judgment on him. And but then the guard, he he gets the drop on, and he absolutely humiliates her. So you know, it's it's not the main character being brought low. I mean, he's being brought low because that's what you do in fiction. You bring a character low, and then they have to rise up. But he gets his comeuppance on the guard fairly quickly <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and makes her look terrible in front of Probably her. the most mischievous thing he's done in the MCU that you've seen on screen. Yeah, it was absolutely. <laughs> and it, was, it was a moment that I really liked because it was just him giving in to complete pettiness. And, and that's that's our Loki right there. Yeah, so uh, I, we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
you know, obviously there's a lot of things involving Loki throughout the, the time in the, the Marvel comics. They've chosen a story I don't know that I would have went to, but as you said, there is a germ of a good idea there. Don't know that we saw it on the screen here today. Not, <laughs> it, it was just boring, Aaron. It was a lot of setup. It felt like a zero issue in a comic book. I don't. I don't think I was as bored as you. Uh, I think that <laughs> I I did enjoy it uh, for what it was. It just wasn't what I expected. So that it, it took took a moment for me to kind of like adjust my expectations of oh oh this is what this is, and then I just tried to go with it. Uh, so I, I actually enjoyed it a little bit more. I'm hoping that uh, it's setting up something pretty great. Um, but like I said, the uh, the Disney Plus uh, MCU is half and half for me right now. So I, I'm I'm pretty much on the fence. Yeah. So I'm giving this like I'll give it a two and a half star. You said you're giving it six out of ten. And we'll see you next week to talk about Loki episode number two. Hopefully they they pick things up. And uh, you know when Tom Hiddleston was getting to do Loki stuff, it was good. Let's, uh, <laughs> next week, let's have a completely different and arbitrary uh, rating system. Like, you come up with something, I'll come up with something. <laughs> and, uh, I'm using pizzas next week. Yeah, we'll week. have some fun with it. <laughs> Three slices. <laughs> <laughs> All right, later, Eric.